This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. If you watch our stream, Wisecrack Live, you might have seen me having an honest to goodness breakdown recently. The analogy would be this, let's do it better guys. Let's do a better job than ladies man, James Lindsay, whose penis has never left his pants and he pees his pants all the time. I'm, I'm saying he's never taking his pants off. Every time he pees, he pees his pants. The reason? Well, I watched a self-styled public intellectual butcher the work of education theorist, Paolo Freire. What you're saying right here is maybe if we want people to read, this is what, what Freire would say, let's give them text that apply to them and engage in the cultures in which they live. But Lindsay says this is bad. The freak out wasn't just because he was totally wrong, but he was. So is the point here that systems don't exist, organized networks uh, of power and organization don't exist? Like there's no such thing as a system? Or because his misinterpretation has dangerous implications, which it does. He just said the cause of school shootings is, is just restorative justice and inclusive classrooms. It was also because it reminded me that the only figures with large public platforms talking about subjects like philosophy and social theory these days seem to be idiots, especially here in America. There are exceptions in the 94-year-old Noam Chomsky, the 69-year-old Cornel West, and the American-friendly 73-year-old Slavoj Žižek. But along with all being, respectfully, super old, their voices have an increasingly small seat at the table of digital discourse. So what happened? Is the disappearance of public intellectuals, and especially of public philosophers, symptomatic of a wider anti-intellectual streak? Did public geniuses fail us? Did we fail them, or both? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, where did all the smart people go? But before we get into it, I wanna tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Storyblocks. Now, Storyblocks is the ultimate stock solution, providing an unlimited library of over 1 million royalty-free, high-quality videos and audio files and images through cost-effective subscription plans. Now, Storyblocks is perfect for when you're in need of a quick soundbite, a B-roll clip, a template, or a graphic. Anything from Storyblocks' massive library of high-quality footage, After Effects templates, songs, illustrations, and sound effects is yours to download watermark-free. New content is added regularly, prioritizing in-demand keywords, so you always have what you need to stay current with trends and news. Now, many other stock providers make licensing expensive and complicated, but you deserve better. Storyblocks created two clear-cut licenses with comprehensive coverage, so you can get back the time you'd spend wading through legal jargon and create with confidence. Here at Wisecrack, we actually totally really love Storyblocks. Their content library makes it so much easier for us to find exactly the right B-roll. And just between the two of us, there was a time where we were only able to use free stock and Creative Commons footage and it sucked. So it's way better to be back with Storyblocks. If you make content, I think you'll love it too. So click on the link in the description or go to storyblocks.com slash wisecrack to learn more about Storyblocks. That's storyblocks.com slash wisecrack. Check it out, I really think you'll love it. But for now, back to the show, which, which we probably use Storyblocks to help make. To understand how public intellectuals got shoved out of the discourse, it helps to think about how we talk about big ideas in the first place. Put simply, we live <laughs> in a society that is straight up hostile to intellectualism. And we could do an entire video on just that point. And if you wanna watch that video, let us know in the comments and we'll make it. But for our purposes, here's a TLDR from historian Richard Hofstadter, who diagnosed the problem way back in 1964, arguing that America had never developed a robust intellectual culture comparable to those of European countries, though arguably the problem has reached something of a zenith today. He credits this phenomenon in large part to Americans' application of market logic to knowledge, equating its value to its material purpose, i.e. taking pre-med biology will help you become a doctor and make bank, so it's valuable. Philosophy? Well, hey, if you don't believe a philosophy degree will get you straight to the top, just look at me. We also see this logic at play in the continued closure of philosophy and humanities departments at universities. Most recently, we learned that Marymount University in Virginia is attempting to close the departments of theology, philosophy, mathematics, art, history, sociology, English, economics, and secondary education. How can you have a university without English? 
without math? How can you have a Catholic university without theology and religious studies? And I'm not trying to exaggerate, but that's basically all the most important programs in terms of developing an ability to think critically. Today's anti-intellectual streak is especially dangerous if you work in fields that challenge pre-existing ideologies. Just ask black studies scholars and teachers in Florida. There, pressure from Governor Ron DeSantis to censor much of African-American history is stifling curriculums. So we largely value knowledge that leads to wealth and or power, and we limit provocative ideas that challenge the status quo. Not exactly a great recipe for a thriving intellectual culture. Hey, I want to kill Ms. Bowen. Does anyone want to help me? But smart people still exist, and they're still out there trying to be heard. At TED Talks, of course, founded as a tech conference, hilariously enough, in 1984, TED Talks have become synonymous with online intellectual discourse. They're a place where experts share their hot takes on everything from the future of AI to the power of positive thinking to orgasm cults, and often get a book deal out of it, which may be a bad thing. That's because TED Talks produce what writer Oscar Schwartz dubbed inspiresting content, i.e. content that is inspiring and interesting. The existentialist, I imagine, would not have landed a primetime role. Framed as sales pitches or future predictions, TED Talks often blow minds without scrutinizing people's existing worldviews. As Schwartz explains, stylistically, the inspiresting is earnest and contrived. It is smart, but not quite intellectual, personal, but not sincere, jokey, but not funny. It is an aesthetic of populist elitism. Politically, the inspiresting performs a certain kind of progressivism, as it is concerned with making the world a better place, however vaguely, and without any serious transfers of power. In this way, TED Talk ideology is progressive in terms of pursuing change within a pre-existing system without being critical of the assumptions of that system. Now, as Schwartz notes, the role of public intellectuals has evolved over time, but the TED Talk iteration leaves something to be desired. He writes, in ancient Athens, public speaking was understood primarily as a means of persuasion. Learning to convince others was the duty of a democratic citizen. For Confucius, refined speech was the embodiment of refined ethics. In 19th century America, popular lectures delivered in lyceums up and down the East Coast were seen as a form of moral uplift, raising the nation's cultural standards and satisfying the middle class's rapacious appetite for useful knowledge. The primary function of TED, by contrast, is to predict the future. And incredibly enough, the TED Talk seems to be changing the way we talk about big ideas outside of the academy and within it. Media theorist Benjamin Bratton explained this in a TEDx speech called What's Wrong with TED Talks? In it, he talked about his friend, an astrophysicist, explaining his complex research to a potential donor. After the presentation was over, the donor told him, You know what? I'm going to pass. I'm just not inspired. You should be more like Malcolm Gladwell. Bratton argues that this shows how the TED rhetorical style, which he calls middle-brow megachurch infotainment, is directly impacting the ways academic research is vetted today prioritizing entertainment and heartstring tugs over rigor. This is not popularization. This is taking something with substance and value and coring it out so that it can be swallowed without chewing. And the TED Talk is symptomatic of a larger phenomenon, the way bullshit dilutes serious discourse. Back in 2005, philosopher Harry Frankfurt assessed the problem of bullshit. He distinguished the bullshit from the liar because the bullshit is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. His eye is not on the facts at all, except insofar as they may be pertinent to his interest in getting away with what he says. He does not care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. He just picks them out or makes them up to suit his purpose. Frankfurt noticed that today, everyone is encouraged to have an opinion about everything leading to the massive proliferation of bullshit. He writes, bullshit is unavoidable whenever circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what he is talking about. Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic exceed his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to that topic. He adds that this is all exacerbated by our collective sense that in a democracy, everybody should have an opinion about most things. 
And there's nowhere more democratic than the internet when it comes to finding welcome ears for your half-baked theories. The internet affects public discourse in many ways, but we'll focus on two. First, there's the siloing of people into confirmation bias bubbles on social media, where we're only presented with ideas we already agree with. Writer Elizabeth Mitchell argues that this is antithetical to real discourse, saying you can't be a truly public intellectual if you speak only to your in-group, or if you respond to criticism of your views with name calling. You know, I, I'm not inclined to continue an interview with a person as badly motivated as you. This then leads to fragmentation of public discourse, and the rise of niche intellectuals as influencers who acquire fans rather than a following of serious thinkers. If anyone can be a public intellectual, do they even have value anymore? Secondly, there's the sheer overload of information on the internet, leading to what essentially functions as fire hosing, a well-known propaganda technique in which the powerful ambush the public with so much fake, contradictory information, they can't possibly parse through it. When we can't absorb every piece of information, it's easy to become intellectually lazy. As Canadian theorist Marshall McLuhan explained, when you give people too much information, they resort to pattern recognition. That can often mean sorting through information in ways that confirms what we already think is true. This also leads to shit like QAnon, but more on that another day. In an environment where bullshit reigns and there's too much information to absorb, people favor debate, not discourse, and prefer content that is short, snappy, and biting rather than deep and challenging. And YouTube compilation culture makes this itch all too easy to scratch. If I was told to do what all monotheists are told to do and admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say no, fuck you. In this way, misinformation, information overload, and bullshit poison discourse and create an environment that smothers would-be public intellectuals while leaving a vacuum for public pseudo-intellectuals to own each other in debate, valuing winning over furthering intellectual discourse. But maybe we're being too hard on ourselves. Maybe the problem isn't the public, it's the intellectuals themselves. See, intellectuals today, public or not, are mostly scholars who studied extremely specific topics and only address each other in their work. Some worry that writing for a popular audience would mean dumbing down their ideas. In 1985, Berkeley sociologist Robert Bella argued that specialization was isolating scholars from audiences and urged his colleagues to engage in conversations with fellow citizens about matters of common interest. Long before that, scholar William James warned against hyper-specialization, i.e. being really smart about one very specific area of knowledge, often without reference to the broader world. James foresaw problems stemming from the professionalization of philosophy. He lamented the growing expectation that college-level teachers have PhDs in his essay, The PhD Octopus, writing that it is indeed odd to see this love of titles and such titles growing up in a country of which the recognition of individuality has so long been supposed to be the very soul. This makes sense coming from James, a 20th century philosopher who began his studies in psychology and never earned a PhD. Long before the invention of the podcast, James argued that character and personality were important to cultivating one's status as a public intellectual. He warned that America is a nation rapidly drifting towards a state of things in which no man of science or letters will be accounted respectable unless some kind of badge or diploma is stamped upon him, and in which bare personality will be a mark of outcast estate. He called this tendency grotesque. After all, if scholars don't engage the public with passion and gravitas, who will? Meanwhile, intellectuals are hyper-specialized and writing and speaking mostly to other intellectuals in their field. So, are we screwed? Or could we learn something from other societies with more robust intellectual cultures? Well, there's nowhere better to find our answer than ancient Greece, where Socrates spent his life questioning authority until authority killed him. Now for Socrates, public intellectual life meant criticizing major institutions, which made plenty of powerful people see him as a threat. He spoke to everybody, regardless of status or class. And his goal wasn't to win fans or followers, but to be the occasion for other people to think for themselves. His use of language was relatively plain and accessible. And importantly, he advocated for intellectual independence and warned against appealing to anyone else's authority. 
He and his student Plato believed that choosing to pursue an intellectual life was a weighty commitment. As philosopher Paul Woodruff explains, they believed that if individuals turn to philosophy, their lives are changed. They set wisdom and virtue as their goals in place of power, wealth, or reputation, and their peers may fear that they have become useless. This is also why in the famous allegory of the cave from Plato's Republic, when the knowledge thirsty dude tries to free his cave dwelling friends, they friggin try to kill him. American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, who began his career as an abolitionist preacher, argued for a similar vision of intellectualism. He wrote, there goes in the world a notion that the scholar should be a recluse, a valetudinarian, as unfit for any handiwork or public labor as a penknife or an ax. The so-called practical men sneer at speculative men, as if because they speculate or see, they could do nothing. However, he argued scholars could fight these preconceptions by engaging more with broader society, by taking decisive actions that embody their thinking. He writes, action is with the scholar subordinate, but it is essential. Inaction is cowardice, but there can be no scholar without the heroic mind. The preamble of thought, the transition through which it passes from the unconscious to the conscious is action. Only so much do I know as I have lived. Instantly we know whose words are loaded with life and who's not. So he's basically saying only by really living can philosophers bridge the gap between them and the general public. Or as universally uncontroversial figure Karl Marx once said in his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Unfortunately, today, many public thinkers are more attention-seeking than they are action-oriented. Scientists in the public eye are mostly here to entertain us with factoids, puns, and overly literal takes. Yeah, Neil, we're talking about you. And I said, uh, yeah, you can make a lightsaber that can cut through things, but if it's actually made of light, they would just pass through one another. The activism of public intellectuals is often measured by Twitter pontification rather than genuine action. But we've seen some modern embodiments of Emerson's vision for intellectuals. There was Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci, so committed to his anti-fascist intellectual ideals that he was thrown into jail, where he kept writing and eventually died. Or take Carl Sagan, who was not afraid to comment on current affairs, like when he argued that American society chooses to allow homelessness. In Emerson's spirit, he was also not afraid to take action, and was even arrested for protesting nuclear testing in 1986. He looked at the broader discourse outside his expertise, warning the public about the overall rise of pseudoscience and superstition, and imploring them to find ways to overcome these dangerous trends. Whether it's still possible for there to be another Gromsky or Sagan remains unclear. Could an action-oriented public intellectual, knowledgeable beyond a single expertise, cut through the noise and earn the same acclaim today? Or would they just be shouted down by hot takes and half takes and people telling them their voice isn't sexy. But let us know what you think. Um, thank you so much to our patrons for really creating the space for us to explore big ideas um, and also for being interested enough to get extra discussions and participate in our Discord community where we have a lot of fun debate. So if you're interested in joining that community of free thinkers, there's a link in the description. But thank you to everyone. We love that you watch these videos and comment even when you don't always agree, because that's what it's all about, right? But we thank you for being on this journey with us. Really appreciate it. And be sure to check us out on Twitter and TikTok as well, because, well, we still live in a world run by a digital economy that we have no control over. But most importantly, hang loose, and we'll catch you next time.